All right, so OBGYN imaging encompasses a whole variety of we start discussing things like normal anatomy of first trimester, you know, right from the blastocyst, et cetera, from a six cell stage, 12 cell, cell stage, so on and so forth, all the way up to the postpartum period. So obstetric imaging is all of that. And here I'll be doing an assortment, you know, we'll be discussing one or two things from each trimester so we can get an overview. And then I will start um, uh, regional anatomy or regional um, abnormalities uh, from the next lecture. All right, so this is a spectrum of real patient cases from our institution that had actual medical issues during pregnancy. Now, the most common problem that the patients come in with, these pregnant patients come in with, is pelvic pain. One thing we need to know that not all pelvic pain in pregnancy is abnormal. Some pelvic pain in pregnancy can be normal. However, the, normal, the normality of the uh, pelvic pain can be caused by a fetal position or movement. Round ligament pain, because the round ligaments get stretched as, they, uh, as the uterus enlarges and becomes an abdominal organ from being a pelvic organ. You can have the Braxton Hick contractions, which are the false labor, and enlarging uterus. So, you know, our job is basically what is physiological to pregnancy and what is pathological to pregnancy. Problems which are really pathological may be obstetric, gynecological, or, or related to organs that are surrounding the uterus, such as GI, hepatobiliary, urinary, or vascular symptoms. Ultimately, we have to make a quick decision because any delay in diagnosis can help uh, or can uh, deteriorate maternal and fetal health. So immediately you want to recognize, I think this is physiological, nothing to be done. I think this is pathological, this is to be done. So we don't have much time. You can't say, oh, well, you're six months follow up or a three month follow up. You may not have a surviving fetus and mother by that time. Basically, the obstetric prop, uh, processes that are common and we deal with them are abortion, preterm labor, uterine rupture ectopic or heterotopic pregnancy, placental complications, and maternal factors complicating fetal well-being or delivery. So I'm going to be discussing each of these today. Like I said, we'll go from the, every trimester. We'll look at a couple of cases from each trimester. This is just like an overview to get the party started. All right, so let's discuss the abortion, preterm labor, uterine rupture later, and we'll do the ectopic pregnancy now. Now, all of you all, we've, I've taken a dedicated didactic lecture on ectopic pregnancy in itself. And um, um, to put all, to summarize ectopic pregnancy in one sentence, I would say that the patient comes in with a positive urine pregnancy test. The discriminatory level of the beta HCG is above 2000, and you don't see anything in the endometrial cavity. When these three criteria are met, our suspicion for ectopic pregnancy is very high, right? When the discriminatory level of 2000 and the beta HCG is below that, at that time the patient is kept under close watch. Patient can be re-imaged with a serial beta HCG at 48 to 72 hours. And if the serum beta HCG is less than 1000, as you all know, the patient can be discharged and can return in two to three days. So the implantation of fertilized egg in a location outside the uterine cavity, by definition, it occurs in the fallopian tubes majority, cervix, ovary, corneal ligament of the uterus and the abdominal cavity. These are all the potential locations of an ectopic pregnancy. It occupies 2% of all pregnancy. Well, having said that, I also want to say it occupies 11% of pregnancies that require assisted reproductive techniques. So 2% of normal pregnancies, 11% of pregnancies that needed assistance. It can be life-threatening, most common cause of pregnancy-related mortality in first trimester. That's why it's a big deal, you know, is it ectopic, is it not? Because it can be, it's the most common cause of pregnancy-related mortality in first trimester. Risk factors include previous ectopic pregnancy, fallopian tube surgery, sexually transmitted diseases. You know all that. Let's take a look at this. Are the images projecting well or no? Or we can turn down some lights. No, not projecting well? Okay. Oh. Now, better? Okay. All right. So um, here we see that this is a patient who, uh, um, I won't be asking too many questions. Uh, I'll try and talk about it. So this is a uh, uterus, as you can see. This is a transvaginal image. As you see this is a sector scanner. The uterus um, is right here. The endometrial cavity is actually totally um, empty or devoid of products of conception. And you see there's complex fluid here in the cul-de-sac. In the right ovary, we see that there is a large thick-walled cystic structure, which is cystic as well as solid. And you see what is a very early embryo in the um, right ovary. So this was a classic definition of the ectopic pregnancy. However, not all pregnancies that we see in day-to-day -day life are disadvanced, and pregnancies can be very early on and one doesn't know. 
So like I said, the index of suspicion should be very high when the beta ECG is close to 2000 and the endometrial um, cavity is empty. All right, this is yet another patient. Um, you see that this is a transverse image of the uterus. This is the right and the left horn. And in this, um, sorry, this is a, I take that back. This is a twin pregnancy that is occurring in the adnex sign, the left adnex cell. So this was a twin pregnancy that was occurring in the left tube. It looks like the bilateral horns, I apologize. And then when you put on color, not only did you see the classic ring of fire appearance of both the twins, but you can appreciate a yolk sac in one twin and maybe a reminiscence of a very early embryonic pole in the second twin. So these were actually ectopic pregnancies in the left fallopian tube which were twin gestations. This is very rare. This is the only case I have seen as uh, ectopic pregnancies with twinning. Coming next to uh, MRI image, this is the, as you can see, sagittal and a coronal image. Then and this is, remember these patients are those patients that are already suspected to have an ectopic pregnancy. You know, they have the same um, serum um, values like I spoke to you and where ultrasound is not able to confidently locate an ectopic gestation, but what is producing that beta HCG, one needs to know, one needs to get to the bottom of it. So this is one of those rare cases that we actually go ahead and do an MRI. And here on the MRI, this is the uterus, this is a urinary bladder, this is the spine, and this is the sigmoid colon. You can see the anterior lip and the posterior lip of the uh, cervix, this is the uterus. And you see right here, anterior lower cervix or lower uterine segment, you see a, a hyper intense um, uh, focus, which was the source of production of that beta HCG. This was noted to be a pregnancy in the cesarean section scar. Now why is cesarean section scar such a fond uh, location for an intrauterine ectopic pregnancy? The reason for that is that once you have done the cesarean section and you're removing all your um, instruments, you are dropping some endometrium along the way into this myometrium where the scar is. And therefore, in the future, it becomes a favorable site for deposition of the conceptus. All right, looking next, so let's look at these images. This is a coronal and this is a sagittal MRI image that demonstrates, let's get uh, our normal anatomy bearings right here. This is way anterior, so this is a urinary bladder. This is a large complex solid cystic mass lesion. This is the uterus and again, a very large complex solid cystic mass lesion. So in a young patient who is noted who is at least having a positive urine pregnancy test and maybe a beta HCG of 8,000, but you see that the endometrial cavity is empty. This was noted to be a parasitic pregnancy, a parasitic ectopic pregnancy within the endometrial cavity. So when you have a parasitic or a um, abdominal pregnancy, where is the blood supply coming from? The blood supply, basically, the omentum is where this is sitting, and it has a, has a low pressure effect like any pregnancy does and it's getting a lot of blood supply from the surrounding omentum, mesentery, so on and so forth. So this is a patient that had an abdominal pregnancy, an abdominal ectopic, and um, this is the uterus. Any questions so far? Uh, literature says that sometimes abdominal pregnancies very rarely have, could even be carried to term. Yes, it can be carried to term. So there is, uh, just depends upon how much blood supply can, uh, will feed that fetus. It may be carried to term. So that was an abdominal pregnancy. So let's look at another patient here. This is, um, again, a 21-year-old uh, black female with G2P2 at nine weeks gestation, a work with acute onset right lower quadrant plane. So let's see what's going on. Here we see a cervix. This is the fundus of the uterus. This is the body of the uterus. You see in the endometrial canal that there is a, um, a cystic fluid collection, which is a fetus and a yolk sac. So there is an intrauterine collection. What is abnormal about this image is look at the myometrial mantle. Normally, when you have an intrauterine pregnancy, it usually locates eccentrically in the region of the fundal endometrium. The overlying myometrial mantle should be larger than at least half a centimeter in size. Here this measured about 0.4 centimeters. Can anybody tell me what this diagnosis could be? Very good, this is an interstitial pregnancy. An interstitial pregnancy is that that occurs in the horizontal limb of the endometrium where the fallopian tubes will come off. So the interstitial segment of the fallopian tube is that which is towards the superior fundus going laterally to where the origins of the fallopian tubes will occur. So this was an interstitial pregnancy right here. Also, the left ovary, you see that has a complex structure here, and there is a lot of fluid surrounding the right ovary. 
Yes. the interstitium because of the thinning right there. Yes, right? the thinning of the overlying myometrial mantle. The normal myometrial mantle overlying any pregnancy is usually more than a centimeter and 0 0.5 to 1 centimeter is kind of a gray zone but if it is less than half a centimeter or five millimeters then it's very highly suspicious for a uh, for an interstitial pregnancy. So this myometrial mantle is what we are looking at. This should not be thin. I remember in one particular patient, there was no myometrial mantle. I mean, you saw a fetus, a gestational sac, and then that's it. I mean, you don't see any myometrial mantle. At that time, I was young in residency. I did not know what it meant. Surprisingly, my attending didn't know it either. So we said it was a normal pregnancy. Patient returned after four days with uterine rupture. So from that day on, I make the point that my residents don't make that mistake. So having said that, we see that this is a right ovary that appears normal. However, there is hemoperitoneum and you see that there is complex fluid surrounding the ovaries. And over here, you see a complex solid cystic structure that is showing you some peripheral vascularity as you see here. This was noted to be a second pregnancy. This was not identified on ultrasound. Uh, this was detected only at surgery. This was a ruptured heterotopic pregnancy. So interstitial pregnancy in the uterine horn and in the uterine uh, interstitium and an ectopic pregnancy in the left ovary. So this was that patient where you can see that there's a large amount of hemoperitoneum right here. This is the ectopic gestation uh, of the left ovary that they are taking out. This is all the complex synechae and this is the normal appearing contralateral ovary. Any questions so far? Yes, five millimeters should be the minimal thickness of the myometrial mantle that overlies the gestational sac. All right, so we've discussed ectopic pregnancy, we've discussed right about every location, we discussed the um, cervix, we've discussed the adnexa, we've discussed interstitial, we've discussed uh, um, 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 uh, abdominal pregnancy, and like, you, like I said, I do a, an ectopic pregnancy lecture by itself. Now looking at placental abnormalities, by no means is this complete, I'm gonna do a placental lecture by itself, but this is like just an overview. So placental abnormalities can be number one for location of position. That are the most common placental abnormalities are position related, previa. Number two, adherence. What is the relationship of the placenta to that of the uterine wall? Is it just adhering to it? Has it invaded into it? Or has it perforated in or penetrated into it? So previa is a condition in which there is a placenta that is the first thing that will come out of the cervix when the delivery happens. So it intervenes between the presenting part of the fetus, which could be the legs, could be the buttocks, could be the head, whichever is the presenting fetal part and the cervix, it intervenes between the two. Uh, abnormalities like placenta accreta, increta and percreta are abnormalities of adherence of the placenta to the myometrium. A creta, like the name suggests, is adherent to it. It's just stuck onto it and it probably can be removed without torrential hemorrhage. So A means just adherent. I means invaded. So in creta means it's invaded. Means do not expect that this will just scoop out at surgery. Please try another route of delivery. Do not intend to do an in crete with patients with suspected in creta. Do not intend to do vaginal deliveries. You may have to remove the uterus as well. And per creta is one in which the uh, placenta has not only invaded but it has penetrated a great thickness or a reliable thickness of the myometrium where that means that it could have like a tumor would infiltrate it has penetrated the uh, myometrial endometrial junction and now for a considerable degree degree has penetrated the myometrium so that's why adherent invaded and penetrated so please remember that with increta percreta and acreta then coming to hematoma and abruption. Hematoma and abruption are um, uh, abnormalities of the placenta in which there is early detachment. Those are problems that the placenta is getting detached from the endometrial lining sooner than it should. That is sooner than the time of delivery. So we look into that as well. So uh, I'll orient you uh, right here. So this is the presenting part of this fetus right here. This is the fetal head. Everybody can identify. These are the ventricles right here. This is the cervix. Right here, as you can see, the anterior lip, the posterior lip. This is over here, the urinary bladder. So if this is the fetus, this is the cervix, this is the urinary bladder, we see that there is an additional amount of soft tissue that is anterior or ahead of the presenting part. This was a uh, 
placenta previa. Now, placenta previa has four grades, and I will discuss each of those grades when I do the placental lecture. But just so that you know, depending upon the encroachment, this is the anterior and the posterior lip of the cervix. And as you can see, if this is the endocervical canal right here, the previa has encroached across to the posterior lip. So definitely when this widens or opens up at the, and thins out, the cervix thins out at the time of labor, the uh, uh, placenta will cause a problem in delivery. So you do not want to deliver this uh, vaginally. So that wasn't placenta previa. Let's look at another case. This is also a patient with placenta previa, just that this has additional imaging. Like I said, in obstetric imaging, the threshold of the OBGYN to obtain an MRI imaging is not very high. So, you know, if they think that the ultrasound is not giving them the entire picture, they move ahead to uh, MRI seamlessly. So right here, let's look, this is a sagittal and a coronal image of the MRI of the fetus. As you can see, this is the presenting part right here, the fetus. This is amniotic fluid. This is the urinary bladder, the rectum, and the uh, spine. And you see that there is additional tissue that is causing closure or at least encroaching upon the entire endocervical canal. This is the anterior lip and the posterior lip of the cervix. And this is a structure that is crossing the lips of the cervix or crossing the endocervical canal. So this is actually a grade 4 placenta previa that it has crossed over and will invariably obstruct uh, delivery. Um, we see the same thing here on coronal imaging. Are there any questions so far? <coughs> now, uh, a question that the OBGYN may have is that Look at the uh, myometrium here. You can see some myometrium here, but back here the myometrium was not reliably seen. So they raised the possibility of a placenta accreta with placenta previa because they thought that this was adherent or attached closely to the myometrium. This may be a placenta accreta and a placenta previa. And at surgery, they did find a placenta accreta. All right, then coming next, uh, does anybody want to take this case except for Laura? Piyush, would you like to take this case or no? Okay. So, um, Piyush, let's look at the axial image first. There is a uterine anomaly here. Can we identify the anomaly? Correct. So, this is an anomalous uterus, whether it's a septate, biconduit, didelphus. But it is an anomalous uterus and harbors two horns. Are we uh, uh, concordant on that? Okay. Okay. All right. Then what's happening? What's going on in this uh, in these horns? So this patient had two horns and pregnancy was harbored in one horn. Is this me? No, it's not me because I don't even have my picture. Okay. So just a history, this patient delivered a non-viable fetus at 19 weeks and had a retained placenta. So patient delivered at an outside facility. The pregnancy was in the left horn. However, the placenta would not deliver. And after delivery of the fetus, they shipped the patient here for delivery of the placenta. At that time, um, they actually had spent three and a half hours trying to deliver the placenta and they were not able to. And we diagnosed that this patient had a placenta in Creta. Um, what I want to tell you is that this pregnancy, this is already delivered. This is just a placenta. And they were able, to, they call this a placenta in Creta based on the fact that the myometrial junction over here lying the fundus is not clear. Not only is the myometrium very thin in that region and it, because of the anatomical aberrance that there was no particular hypointense line that you see here, the hypointense signal was absent in the fundal region and they had to do a hysterectomy for this patient because this patient turned out to be an increated uh, uh, placenta. All right, coming next. Um, this is a G4P2, 22-year-old patient with three times previous cesarean section. Uh, now patient has had yet another uh, delivery. We've um, uh, delivered the patient, and now this is what we see. Um, without um, um, much, does anybody want to take this case? 
the history of cesarean section and even one cesarean section puts this patient at risk for a placental adhesion abnormality because you have invaded the endometrium at least once because you have delivered via cesarean section. So you have invaded the endometrial cavity once, correct? And that's why the patient is as such at a 20% risk at least of a placental adhesion abnormality. Yes, Yemisi, you wanted to take this case. Very good. This is exactly, this is a percreta. This is a placenta percreta. What happens at percreta? It's like a mass, like a tumor that penetrates into the surrounding tissue. So where is the normal fat plane that should intervene between the urinary bladder and the lower uterine segment? It's absent. And you see this fairly large lobulated mass lesion that is now invading the dome of the urinary bladder. To deliver or to even to do a hysterectomy for this patient, interventional radiology was called on board where they put two catheters with balloon inflation into the internal iliac arteries and therefore hysterectomy was performed because they were expecting it to have a very, very um, uh, hemorrhagic um, uh, surgery. And this is this uh, picture post-surgery. They were not able to remove all the placental tissue without doing a cystectomy and they decided to leave the urinary bladder in there. So this is part of the placental tissue that remained adhered to the dome of the urinary bladder. However, they were able to remove the uterus and I guess they were able to remove whatever they could of the aberrant placental tissue. This is showing you the angiogram where there was so much vascularity of the placenta at that time and after balloon occlusion, um, the hysterectomy was performed. So it's a very interesting case. If anybody is interested in writing it up with me, please let me know. Yes. What is the need to uh, remove the placenta? It's a very vascular uh, organ. Even with, uh, and it is, of course, placenta is now attached to the peritoneum, as you can see. It's definitely, you know, there's a fold of peritoneum right here in the urethrovesical pouch. It is now adhered to that. Uh, it can parasitize. It can bleed with minimum trauma. Why? How can we leave a vascular structure as such in the peritoneal cavity? You know, but I, I suspect it can uh, bleed with hormonal changes, even though it doesn't have endometrium. I believe it can bleed with minimal trauma. It can cause mass effect on surrounding organs. I'm not sure if it can grow. No, they just did the uh, to treat this. Yes. I'm not aware. I'm not aware. But uh, this is the best they could remove. This red um, uh, lobulated thing is the placenta. All right. Now we come next to maternal trauma. Maternal trauma complicates six to seven percent of all pregnancies. What is important is majority of this trauma is not related to motor vehicle crash. It is related to domestic violence. So majority of these patients are punched in the stomach from boyfriend, husband, so on and so forth. And therefore, when, um, therefore, um, you know, we'll show you some images. They can be fairly gruesome. So external fetal monitoring and ultrasound is what is needed to um, uh, uh, evaluate these patients. Assessment of the patient should not be limited due to pregnancy. I mean, if you're suspecting that patient has a broken hip, uh, or a broken, uh, let's say, femur or maybe an ischium. And MRI probably is not the best way to proceed. You can do in advance, second and third trimester, go with the CT. CT remains a preferred imaging modality for the trauma patient and clinical or ultrasound signs of visceral injury. So if there is a FAST exam that is positive or if there is patient complaining of, you know, an, um, uh, 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 the clinical exam of, uh, you know, positive for being for a fracture or for hemoperitoneum, so on and so forth, you might have to go ahead with the CT study. MRI is impractical in the trauma setting because, you know, of the restricted environment and long exam time. Sometimes the patient may not have that such of an ex a long exam time. And always you have to outweigh the mother's life is more important than the fetus's life. That is the dictum that the ER invariably follows. Yes, Gina. trimester, I read quite a while ago that it could affect cell migration with the magnetic fields. Yes, that, that study is true if the magnetic fields are higher than 3 Tresla. So if they are higher than, no, no problem with 1.5 or 3 Tesla, but magnetic uh, even uh, the same principles apply that you in very early first trimester you should not put color Doppler imaging on the um, early uh, embryo for the same reasons and uh, the MRI too that there could be cell migration because of heating and that is only evident from three Tesla onwards. 
So here we have some cases of maternal trauma. This is a 15-year-old girl who was 29 weeks pregnant, who was an unrestrained backseat passenger with loss of consciousness after a high-speed motor vehicle crash. C-section was performed emergently for non-reassuring uh, fetal heart tones. Uh, does anybody want to take this case, or shall I uh, spill the beans? Yes. Axial um, is that CT images. Yes. yes. Uh, there's a hypodense material at the insertion of the placental and anterior portion. Uh, there's hypertense layering next to your point, next to the mouse pointer. Uh, is this what you're saying? The media, uh, go yeah. There. Okay. Um, I mean, this looks. Placental abruption. Very good, very good. This is placental abruption. Any other abnormality, Dan? But what was your question? Any other abnormality? This, Any other abnormalities? Yes, this is placental abruption. Uh, the patient presented. So, yeah. Uh, further uh, on, on the image on the right, uh, top right, there's uh, there's continued uh, like hematoma. It appears. Very fairly large retroplacental hematoma. Yes. What else? Anything else? I wish we had a pointer that worked. Show me MIP images. Uh, Does anybody have a pointer that actually works? There are several here. Can you give it to Dan, please? Dan, anything on this image? This is called fracture of the fetus. Yeah. So what do we see here? So placenta, like I told you, is a very vascular structure. It always will pick up contrast, right? As you can see, we have given contrast. There is contrast in the IVC. There's contrast in the abdominal aorta. So right away, you know this is a contrast enhanced CT of the um, uh, uh, pelvis. And you see that this is the placenta right here. And there is a retroplacental clot that you can see here. And as you come down inferiorly, a very large retroplacental clot and a skull fracture. This was a 15-year-old lady with 29 uh, weeks, and um, uh, she gave birth to a live child, but had a skull fracture. So, so normally, at that uh, bed gestational age, how thin should the placenta be? Like, what, what should we be seeing? At this that would age? be normal. This would be normal. Okay. This uh, diameter of the placenta would be normal. Okay. This is maybe uh, a little more than normal, but this is what is a placental clot, either inferior or retroplacental clot. Any questions on this patient? Okay. Anybody else wants to take this case? This is a motor vehicle crash um, of a young patient. Uh, anybody who's not taken the case? Uh, I can't see. I'll turn off the lights. What about uh, Laura? Would you like to take this case? Um, I see this is looks like this is the placenta. I think um, it's, I think it's here. The placenta is probably here too. It's on this. Laura, is there some abnormality in the contour of this uterus? Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, let's see. Let's see the previous image. I mean, you can take a pencil or a felt marker and look at the uterus all around. The problem is with the placenta here, correct? What's different here? I can't take a pencil and now etch out a good uterus anymore. Very good. This is a uterine rupture. Why? Because I don't see a well thick enhancing myometrium. Remember the myometrium of percent of pregnancy is called the decidua. A decidua is vascular. This is discontinuous. I see some myometrium here. Don't see anything here. See something here. Not sure. Kind of see it here. This is uterine rupture. Anything else? That's the spine. Very good. The fetal spine. Yes, this is fetal decapitation. Okay. All right. So this is a patient again, a young MVC, unrestrained passenger pregnancy came in 
not only did she have a fairly large blood clot that was surrounding the uterus, especially in the fundal region, all this is a blood clot. This is not a uterus. This is not a normal myometrium that you want to see, that thick wall myometrium that I showed you. This is just blood surrounding the uterus anterior laterally. And here you see there's a disconnect between the spine and this. This is a, a patient with uh, fetal demise and, of course, decapitation. All right, coming to the next section, delivery planning. Any questions regarding placental uh, abruption, previa, and creta, uh, so on and so forth? What is our time frame for the CT, though? I know you said that like later, second trimester, third trimester, we yes. can do the CT. Like, do we have any definitive age? Ages. Right. So the ER guidelines are as such that mother's life supersedes the fetus's life. That is number one. If ultrasound is not able to provide an adequate source of the patient's trauma, irrespective of the viability of the fetus, to save the mother's life, you can do a CT at any time. What can help is that when the patients in first trimester come with acute trauma, mostly the patient is aborting at that time. The fetus or the embryo is no longer viable at that time. So that makes the decision to do CT easier. Does that help? And otherwise, any time in second and third trimester, just go with CT. Okay. Coming to delivery planning, these are just the last few set of slides. Maternal genital urinary anomaly is complicated in pregnancy, labor, and delivery. So we'll be talking about that. We'll talk about hysterectomy, cesarean section planning, and a little bit about MR pel pelvimetry. Okay, let's look at this. Um, does anybody want to take this case? Who is not taken? I can't see from here, but uh, John, are you here? I'm here. Okay, John, let's give it a try. Uh, um, this is two actual MR images of the pelvis, or at the level of the pelvis. This is the fetus. Um, it looks like maybe, I'm not for sure of the measurement, but could this be a little bit not wide enough, but there's some sort of structure intervening here. Okay, what could be that structure? Um, that the colon or bladder off to the side somehow? Colon and bladder usually posterior structure unless the sigmoid colon is very convoluted and very redundant. What else? Could it this be anything else? Okay. So this is again first thing to identify that this is a biconduit uterus. You see that there are two horns. Why is this not a normal structure? Because you see enhancing endometrium here. You see this? So right away you know that this is a second uterine horn. It's not just any bowel gas structure. Again, the feculent appearance, the feculent appearance that you see in the sigmoid colon is absent here. Am I right, John? Normally you see a lot of bizarre appearance in the fe in the, you know, with the feces in the large bowel. This didn't look like that. This actually gives you that there may be a second horn present here. Does that make sense at all? Okay. So this was a twin pregnancy in the left horn of an anomalous uterus. And therefore, at labor, this patient could not deliver normally. Let's look at another patient right here. Um, Hunter. So, sagittal and coronal uh, MR images. Um, this is pointing to a fairly uh, iso intense structure here. I'm not sure what this is, if this is the this is the, the no, no, this is the, uh, so let's orient ourselves. This is the pubic symphysis, the urinary bladder. This is the pregnancy, the head of the baby. This is vertex um, the, uh, lie. And then you see an abnormal structure here. And the history is that the second stage of labor failed to progress. So you went on and on trying, but the patient was unable to deliver normally. What could be one of the causes? Um. Could be uterine rupture. What do you think that blue arrow is pointing to? Any idea? <clears throat> you have two images. The same structure that is here is also here. And that is impeding the uh, outlet of this baby. That is impeding or causing encroachment on the birth canal. Anybody? Is that a second? Like a, the 
uterus. Um. No, uterus is all right, cervix, uterus is all the way around. There's another structure posteriorly here, this being the rectum sigmoid colon. There's another structure here, which is the same structure on coronal. This was a sagittal, this was a coronal image. Okay, if I told you, look at this structure again. Anybody else? It's a bean-shaped structure. A horseshoe. This is a pelvic kidney, an ectopic kidney. So a patient had a pelvic kidney and that impeded the uh, delivery of the fetus. Everybody sees that now? Yeah. All right. Let's come to the next case. This patient again had problems related to vaginal outlet obstruction. Sagittal coronal MR images. Continuated uh, misses. Don't worry about the waiting. Uh, don't worry, just tell me the abnormality. Uh, there was a vaginal obstruction at delivery. Patient could not be delivered vaginally. Like uh, vaginal outlet obstruction. I would, my question is, well, why did they even attempt it after seeing the perineum? But I was going to say, is this like a, no, the, 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 the pelvis is too small. The pelvis didn't open up. Like if it's too okay. So you're, um, uh, uh, Dan, are you thinking the obstruction is a hair somewhere? No, it's a bony abnormality in the pelvis. Like the actual saying, bony pelvis. Okay, you think that the, uh, this is too no, narrow? No, says the passageway is too narrow. The bony pelvis is too narrow to deliver, is that what you're saying? Does anybody see any other abnormal? Yes. yes. Now these are massive condylomita from venereal warts. And it's all the way from the buttocks, all the way to the vagina, going all the way to the vulva. So they had to have a complete vulvectomy and uh, they'd put a flap. Like I said, many of these cases have been shared to me by our OBGYN um, um, program director, Daniel Cooper, because I do a workshop with her every year for the medical students. So when I told her I'm going to be starting to do this, she can share some cases, she shared a few with me. But all, fortunately, she has given me the medical record number of every patient as well. So, you know, if you want to go back and follow them up, we can. Yes. Yeah, a patient was uh, uh, delivered actually at 30 weeks, a premature baby. She went into she labor at 30 weeks. How the baby got in. Well, they had sex. <laughs> no, no, how the. <laughs> that's, that's he wants to know who. You mean, how did she become pregnant? That I don't know. Oh, say I don't get your question in all these jokes. No, it's not a joke. No, no, in all his jokes. No, I, no, no, no. She wants to know, were these condolomas, was this like artificially inseminated pregnancy? No. No, Yemisi, the history that I have is that after the patient got pregnant, apparently, for some other abnormality, she was put on steroids. And, and that is when they uh, uh, proliferated That's rapidly. I wasn't telling a joke. That's what she wanted to know. Why oh, okay, sorry. Why does it go through labor? Because isn't that a contraindication for vaginal delivery? Uh, yes. Absolutely. I, I wonder why they HPV. went. HPV. Yeah, they can aspirate and all that. And they can, uh, I guess, uh, what chorioretinitis and all they can have, I think, I forget. All right, so this was extensive venereal warts. Coming next to five, do we still have time? Because I still have lecture. Okay, leomyomatosis or fibroids. They're commonly encountered during pregnancy, and pregnant women may be hospitalized for myoma-related complications. They are not uncommon. Increase the likelihood of complications during both pregnancy, labor, and delivery. Approximately 50% enlarged during pregnancy, mainly in the first trimester because they have estrogenic receptors mm -hmm. and may enlarge, they may degenerate, they may twist. So having a fibroid with a pregnancy is not a good thing to begin with. You need to be on high guard. Can mechanically obstruct cervix or alter cesarean section hysterectomy as expected. All right, so this is just a simple um, uh, ultrasound that's showing you that this is the same 
fibroid in the uterus that looked rather solid. However, after the inception of pregnancy, when you see a fetus in here, it starts to degenerate. So don't be alarmed when you see solid appearing fibroids in the pre-pregnancy status start to become more cystic, necrotic, degenerating because they do undergo red <coughs> degeneration in pregnancy. Yet another image here, you see that this is a coronal and a sagittal image. And we're just showing you that this is, uh, you know, this is a uh, gravid uterus right here. But here in the cervix, you have a, um, uh, a fibroid which is predominantly solid. But this will definitely obstruct labor and, uh, because it may be in the lower uterine segment but pushed down because of the mechanics or the mass effect from the uh, uh, pregnancy and um, know not to try normal delivery. So this was a cervical fibroid in a patient you should not attempt. Again, uh, does anybody want to take this case? Who has not taken Harita? Who is freshly back from the honeymoon? Simple, we are just talking about fibroids, this is fibroid. So it's just a degenerating fibroid trying to tell you that how much degeneration this fibroid has undergone. Will the patient not present with pain? Of course, the patient will present with severe pelvic pain. And then you have to, you know, weigh it out. Do you need to remove the fibroid or do you need to keep the things? This patient, like here from the history says, this is a 20 centimeter fibroid in this patient and had on uh, pathological section had extensive hyaline, red and cystic degeneration. Uh, from what I understand, Dan, that all bets are off in a pregnant uh, uh, uterus because everything is being supplied so much vascularity that even benign lesion starts to look bizarre. So you want the pregnancy to go on unless you know it's a sar unless it's a bi biopsy probe and sarcoma or something where you might want to operate in second trimester. And you, I have a case of that in which they did go ahead and operate on a, a gravid uterus, but um, they say wait, let it cool down. You know cool down hot sauce kind of a thing, and then we'll see what happens uh, uh, after the patient has delivered successfully. All right, now we come to adnexal masses. They can occur in 2% of all pregnancies. What happened, Dr. Simmons, you have something to say? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Just praising me? Yes. Oh, okay. Occur in 2% of all pregnancies. 65% have no symptoms. Most commonly a functional ovarian cyst is what it turns out to be. One to 8%, however, can be malignant may need surgical removal during pregnancy due to risk of rupture or spread of malignancy. Optimal surgical window is 18 to 20 weeks of gestation. Let's look here. Who wants to take this case? Uh, who is hiding there? Uh, Bhavna? You not had an MRI posting? Okay. Uh, Brad, I'll be nice to you because you're on ultrasound. Laura? Laura can't hear. Yeah. So please, Laura. Yeah. I, this is the head of the fetus. I think that's the uterus. This is the placenta. And this is a large mass. Mm -hmm. Where we can see it here. We're in the um, fibroid. So probably it's a fibroid or something that is. So not a fibroid because we have moved to the oh, next section. I was, yeah. I was in the fold. Because we have moved to the next section. Okay, so it's Correct. What adnexal mass? It's, uh, they uh, you know, did a MRI on this and said it's a tiger touch me not mass. Don't need to do anything about it right at this time. So can you tell me what are these two sequences and what have they uh, uh, decided? What have they figured out? <coughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pre and post fat saturation, what did we find out? That this had macroscopic fat, therefore, correct, this was a teratoma and uh, they didn't worry about it. This is maternal ovarian dermoid. All right, coming next, uh, Yemisi. All three are axial.
So, what is the anatomical location of the abnormality? Presacral. No, this is the sacrum. The presacral is rectum. In the pouch of? In the pouch of Douglas. So, if there is a lesion in a, um, uh, a woman of reproductive age in the pouch of Douglas, what is our first differential? Hmm? Fluid, but this is the fluid, it's a collection, right? It's not just free fluid, it's an encapsulated. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, change your train of thought. You can look at all the images and give me your uh, diagnosis. And remains. So it's white and sticky. But C1 makes it to remain hyperdescent and this hyperdescent of the fat that we also remove. Correct. So this is the Yes, it is blood. What is your diagnosis? Yeah, it's encapsulated. So it's blood. Blood or hemorrhagic cyst, so homogeneous, so homogeneous. How can a hemorrhagic cyst be so homogeneous? Hemorrhagic cyst, classic lattice like lace, lace workers pattern, right? Homogeneous blood containing cystic structure in the pouch of Douglas. Now, next time I'm going to have to get a win. Endometrioma? Yes, endometrioma. Why did it took so long to decide endometrioma? Which is such a common uh, uh, abnormality. First thing, endometrioma is ectopic location which will seat the peritoneum anyway, right? So one of the favorable sites, other than being on the meso-ovarium, is the pouch of Douglas. Endometrioma is very common in the pouch of Douglas. You all know that, right? Next time, it's the T2 shading, the hyperintensity, all tell you that the contents are blood. Very homogeneous, as opposed to uh, competing. The competing diagnosis would be a hemorrhagic cyst. But remember, the um, hemorrhagic cyst can have septations, can have debris, can have retracting clots, so on and so forth. Um, endometrioma, not so much. This, though I says hemorrhagic ovarian cyst, it was an endometrioma. All right, coming next. Who wants to take this? Very easy. One of the last cases, I promise. Uh, Aaron. Coronal and coronal MR images of the uh, abdomen and the uh, cystic structure. Will you please pass the pointer to him? So this is the bladder, this is the uh, gravid uterus, correct? Okay. What's so peculiar about the cystic structure on coronal? What's so peculiar about the abnormality on, by location, not by content or by intensity, but by location, what is so peculiar? We're in adnexal masses, right? Yeah, it's fairly far up towards the structure. Which adnexa is it involving, right or left? Yes. Yes means right or left? Both. So that's your number one clue. It's an abnormality that involves both adnexi. Not every abnormality does that. And both to a similar degree. Correct? Look at the second image. Both the adnexi are involved to a similar degree. Now you only have two differential diagnoses as far as I'm concerned. Please uh, uh, gently give them out. <laughs> gently. Gently. Because you. Dr. Gates has taken the boards. Okay, let's let's see. 
the bilateral adnexal abnormality. I forget the name of it, but you know, it's a response to gravity where it should resolve after pregnancy. But I forget its name. Okay, what you're talking about is a theca leutin cyst, is what Dan is talking about. It can happen sometimes in high progesterone states. But these are not theca leutin cysts, because in theca leutin cysts, the, these are bilateral ovaries, by the way, they do not enhance this massively. Okay, th multiple theca leutin cysts may be seen in a progesterone rich pregnancy or in pregnancies that are molar. A molar pregnancy is associated with bilateral theca leutin cysts. These are not theca leutin cysts because they are associated with enlargement of the ovary. And each of the follicles of these ovaries are enlarged. Aaron, do you see them now? So when you look at this and you see that it's bilateral adnexal abnormality, we're in the adnexal section, and these are all, you know, well marginated, the periphery of the uterus of the ovary. They're all cystic structures. It's a T2-weighted image. They're all cystic. Our diagnosis is this is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. This is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. PCOS could this be PCOS? Um, well, I guess I guess it could be, but with this massive enlargement, acute. I didn't give you the presentation. If I told you that the patient's beta HCG was very high, there was ascites, there was pleural effusion, there was fluid tracking up the Morrison's pouch, and patient presented acutely, maybe with breathlessness, maybe with uh, uh, toxic signs and symptoms, then ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and PCOS are the only two differential diagnoses which can at all be entertained. And of these, this is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. How? Based on presentation. I also want to tell you one thing that patients with um, uh, 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 PCOS are usually have degree of infertility. They are usually infertile, okay? So if you have such advanced PCOS, chances of conception are fairly low, am I right? So if they're showing you a pregnancy, a gravid uterus, go the ovarian hyperstimulation route first. Okay, massively enlarged ovaries, this side and the other. Are there any questions? Can you repeat the presentation again, like the beta HCG and everything that you noted? So basically, these patients will give you history that the, this pregnancy was obtained through some assistance, either clomiphene or IVF, that the patient is on some stimulation, right? What is the nature of the stimulation is that the LH surge, this is what boils down to, the, there is absence of the luteinizing hormone surge through the clomiphene citrate. What happens is when there is an absence of a surge, means it doesn't peak up, there's a constant high level of the luteinizing hormone Multiple follicles develop in the same ovary. When there is a surge, one follicle develops, the rest are inhibited. But when there is no surge, you're giving high luteinizing hormone to that patient, many follicles will develop without inhibition. And that is what happens in these patients, that there are multiple large follicles, anyone can ovulate, and this patient, usually these are IVF or clomiphene citrate type uh, assisted reproductive technique patients. The patient will give you that history. The patient will present, we may present with severe abdominal pain, breathlessness, signs of toxic signs and symptoms. Because what happens is that this causes some kind of a peritonitis. And therefore, you have ascites, pleural effusion, which is all reactive. Yes, yeah, Missy. Yes. Uh, theca leutin cysts are multiple cysts in the ovaries in which the ovarian enlargement is not massive. Even in patients who have complete molar pregnancies, not just partial mole, complete molar pregnancies, those are one set of patients that can have theca leutin cysts. The other set of patients are those who have a Kaline Felter's disease like XXY chromosome. They can have theca leutin cysts. Other ones are progesterone high pregnancies. They can have theca leutin cysts. This is very classic of ovarian hyperstimulation. And ovarian hyperstimulation, expect it on the boards. Oh my God, it's, it, you see it clinically. We see it at least once in six, eight months ourselves when we're not even a high, um, uh, we're not even an infertility center. You know, we were, it's very common on the boards. It's very common in real life. So I will only entertain for these either hyperstimulation or PCOS. And PCOS a little less because uh, the uterus is gravid. Does that make sense? All right, coming to gastrointestinal causes which can complicate pregnancy or present with, uh, with uh, 
pain could be acute appendicitis. We do that all the time. Inflammatory bowel disease, intestinal obstruction, GERD, and peptic ulcer disease. Uh, so, uh, Bhavna, you're on call, and the uh, uh, ER calls you and says, you know, we have a pregnant patient who's 10 weeks pregnant, and she's having right lower quadrant pain. Um, um, uh, what, what will you advise them? And they suspect um, acute appendicitis. They suspect acute appendicitis in any patient who walks in, but this time it is genuine. This time it is genuinely they're suspecting right lower quadrant uh, pain and uh, they want to obviously pass the baton on to you. So what is your recommendation? Ultrasound. ultrasound, correct. So what will you tell them that ultrasound will surely pick it up? Most likely? Okay. Okay, most likely. Are there any, um, uh, anything you will advise the um, ER to do before the patient comes to your ultrasound room? John? Oh. No, 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 oh and all. Quickly, we don't have much time. Uh. So you want, what are you going to do? How are you going to find the appendicitis? You're going to take that probe, put all the weight that you have on your belly and try to scan, milk out the gas, then try and look at the site of maximum tenderness, push, pull, this, that and the other. First thing, patient should have a strong analgesic on board. Second, strong antiemetic on board when the patient comes to the ear, to the ultrasound suite. So patient will allow you to progen, look around in that right lower quadrant, correct? Okay. Okay, so I'll skip the text slides because we don't have much. Okay, what do we see here, John? Um, here you see uh, multiple grayscale images. Uh, looks like we're catching the, on the top image, we're catching Please give John the, the same, don't keep him. Uh, I got it here. Okay. I just have to turn it on. Uh, looks like we're catching it uh, in plane, and then here we're catching it. Uh, in plane means what? Sagittal or transverse? Sag yes. Here, transverse here. Yeah. Uh, I see a thickened wall. I see some paraphendiceal fluid. So, how are you going to describe this? Mm -hmm. I would describe it as a tubular, blind ending structure with. Thickened wall. A lot of prompts you're getting from the corner. That's very good. Um, with um, hypoepigenicity. Very good. So you, it. it's just like your finger. I mean, it's blind ending because it doesn't continue. Tubular structure, non compressible. And uh, the, um, the diameter of the structure, what is the limit of, uh, what is the measurement of the diameter? Upper limits of normal? 6 mm. 6 mm. Thickness of the wall? 3. 3 mm. Very good. And uh, here it's showing you that it's not compressible. What do you see here, John? You can keep going. It's the same uh, diagnosis. You can just show it. Sternal maxillal MR images, level of the pelvis. Um, I see a dilated structure that is uh, giving a hyper intense signal. What's on, what's on, what's this concentric lines on the coronal? Concentric onion skin appearance on the coronal. Anyone? Nothing, it's just your phlegmon. It's a routine phlegmon. So this is a dilated appendix with a phlegmon. It's not the same patient. So Bhavna, you will tell the ER that if the patient has acute appendicitis and the patient is cooperative, the chances of finding acute appendicitis on ultrasound are very high. Very high means almost to the order of 90%. However, the Tech and the resident should know how to scan. You should have, be, and there is a learning curve with that examination. It's not a friendly examination by any means. You need to spend half an hour, 40 minutes scanning the patient. So sometimes on an on, on-call setting, like after hours, when attendings are not in-house, the, the techs may not be able to find it. Okay, And at that time, when you're not able to find it, do not hesitate to order an MRI if the patient is early pregnancy. Same thing, same patient, you see a dilated appendix in the right lower quadrant. Um, acute appendicitis, this is an advanced pregnancy. You can see that this is a placenta. Remember that placenta in third trimester can start to look a little heterogeneous. It can start to have errors of infarction. It can start to have cotyledons that look bizarre. Like these are each of the cotyledons of the placenta. And here you have a uh, tubular structure which looks like acute appendicitis in just in any other patient. Hydronephrosis of pregnancy. What is normal? What is abnormal? Hydronephrosis in pregnancy is normal. Up to what we can be even moderate hydronephrosis can be normal. However, patients can get urinary stones because there is uh, there is relative stasis of peristalsis of the uterus due to mass effect from the gravid uterus. And of course, kidney and bladder infections are a given. 
This is just hydronephrosis. At this level, if the patient is asymptomatic, nothing to be done. Um, let's look at this patient, uh, Piyush. Correct. Why are we seeing the urethral stone? The only reason we are seeing it today because there is associated hydroureter. If there was no hydroureter, this would be just another black dot in an ocean of other black dots. So appreciate this meniscus sign where you have a stone lodged in a dilated ureter and when traveled section by section all the way back, it communicates with the renal pelvis. So it is the hydroureter. Patient went ahead and we did a retrograde pilogram. And they show again a meniscus sign here, which was a calculus right here in the distal end of the ureter as shown by MRI.